I'll hand over to you, Bernadette, to come now. Thanks very much. I uh, will talk for about 20 minutes and wrap it on, and then have a bit of discussion. Because uh, I intend to be up the road to Donegal again uh, as soon as I'm finished. It's difficult sometimes to know where to start the conversation on racism. Uh, and I find myself in a very interesting position that when I'm sitting here at home uh, in Belfast or Tyrone, or but in the context of Ireland, sitting here at home trying to talk about racism, I always get the sensation that I used to get when I was in the United States trying to tell people about the realities of life on this island. Because you never really knew how far back to go to start the story so that they would understand it. So you'd start to say, well, uh, you know, this happened in such a year. And then you'd say, but in order to understand that, they need to understand partition. And they say, in order to understand that, that, they need to understand imperialism. In order to understand that, they need to understand capitalism. So you'd nearly find yourself uh, People only came along to see what kind of a bandage it would stick on a cut. And they found themselves with a history of the universe and they'd say, oh my God, she'll be here to tea time. So it's quite difficult to know where, for the, for the benefit of the people you're talking to, a conversation on, on racism should start. Uh, and a good place sometimes people do start is that they think, no, I'm, I'm not a racist, I'm a good person. Uh, those people over there, they must be racist, uh, but not me. And the reality of life is that I have found in my own experience that unless you are consciously anti-racist, you can't but be racial in your construction. That's just the way it is. And if you want to understand that, uh, and I don't want to offend the men in the company, but it's, again, if you're not consciously thinking about being anti-feminist, then, or sorry, being feminist, then you are thinking in a gender construction that disadvantages women. You can't help it. That's the way the world is. It's the same with sectarianism, it's the same with disability, it's the same with a whole number of things where we construct people as different to ourselves. And we have key ways of, of defining who we are and who they, them ones over there are. And usually in the pecking order, when we're thinking of those who are not us, like if you start in West Belfast, those who are not us, demons in East Belfast, they're not us. Demons up there, they're not us. And what's really interesting, when you start off with who you are yourself, is to look at your compass. Who do you think's up there above you? Who do you think's down there beneath you? And who's to your left and right that you need to watch your back and watch your side in case they come at you? Who are your friends? Who are your allies? Who are your opponents? But who are the people up there and who are the people down there in the context of your own sweet self and then of your own small community? And when you think of it like that, you understand racism and a lot of these other isms a lot better. Because the question of who's up and who's down and who's on either side of you are questions of power and questions of privilege. And that's what racism is about. Same as sectarian is about, same as genderism is about. It's about who has privileges and who has power. And particularly for people uh, here in West Belfast, you could play the old 700-year saga on a fiddle till the cows came home. We know that one. And then the Normans came. <laughs> and then somebody else came. <laughs> and four green fields, and we love it because it positions us in a wonderful place, hard done by, victimized, 
trodden on, dumb out of our rights, dumb out of our power, dumb out of our privilege. And then we locate our allies. We know them all on the world stage. South Africa, hooray, they're with us. The Palestinians, even better, they're with us. There is no ignominy imposed upon humanity that has not been opposed upon the Irish by our favorite enemy, the Brits. But hold on a minute. What turned up in the middle of West Belfast and Tyrone, a whole set of new people who challenged our perceptions of ourselves. Because now we are not the eternal, flawless victim <coughs> whom God put on this earth to add to its general beauty and people came and treated us badly forever. That's a very simplistic way of looking at it. But it helps you sleep at night. Then you have Another situation, demons came from somewhere else, but they're not us. Who do they think they are? And here are some of the things that I have listened to since I've begun to do uh, this particular work. You used to be on our side, Bernard. Now you're with the foreigners. We didn't fight for what we fought for, for them to come in here and take it off us. These are people. We didn't fight for what we fought for, for them to come in and take it off us. Off for people in Belfast. <laughs> but those people aren't racist. I don't mind. I don't mind the Lithuanians coming here. Like, you know, we went to America. But they want to behave themselves when they get here. We don't want any violence. Us? <laughs> we don't. We don't like it. No, not us. We're the extension of Quaker society. <laughs> there never was any violence here till they brought it. Them Lithuanians, they were all in the Russian army and they all carry knives. <laughs> then there's the Portuguese, they all work in the meat industry, brutalize them. They all carry knives. 30 years of war didn't brutalize us? No, not us. Oh. But working in, meat, working in meat plants for minimum wage brutalizes Portuguese people. I have no idea why. And some myth that the Lithuanians were in the Russian army that brutalized them. And you see the Polish, it's a pity of them. They get off light because they're Catholics, or so you think. They get off light, except, you know what their problem is? They drink too much. <laughs> the Polish, the poor Polish drink too much. Lithuanians fight too much. And then you know what they all came for? To steal our money. We all came here to steal our benefits. I can just see a friend of mine at home, Amadou, who comes from Guinea-Bissau. And I have no idea on what day, of what week, of what month, Amadou woke up in Guinea-Bissau and said, today I will make a plan. I will go to Dongyaman in the country of Tyrone, in the north of Ireland, in the United Kingdom, on the edge of northern Europe, and steal their piddling benefits. That's what I do. And he held it up the whole way, from Guinea-Bissau, right through the continent of Africa, across into Europe, kept going, till he finally got to the destination of his life. <laughs> now, if we had known in advance that Amadou had this madness in his head, we'd have sent him a telegram saying, Dear Amadou, the rest of us are trying to get out. <laughs> but we, we keep these, these things all live in the one head. I'm a nice person, I'm not a racist, but I tell you what, I don't, mi I, no, I don't mind them. But they've got a lot of cars now. 
Did you see how many of them have got cures now? Okay. I have got no cure. This may or may not have something to do with the fact that you drink too much. You fight too much. Or it may have to do with the fact you live in West Belfast and you don't need a car at all. But they've got, and some of them, them. You know what they're at next? Buying houses. <laughs> not even renting them. Buying them. Some of them are buying houses we can't afford to buy. And all of that starts to slip in as to who, again, they are and we are. And what are they coming over here for? Taking our jobs. What are they coming over here for? Uh, we wee bit of training sometimes. I don't like, I don't believe in training that makes people feel bad about themselves. So we ask the question, but we never wait for the answer. You know, we don't ask people to show their ignorance in front of the entire assembled audience. But most people in Tyrone, well, not blame you lot, but I imagine you're the same, can't find Lithuania on a map. Most people don't know where France <coughs> starts and Germany ends. In fact, there's some people who don't know where Northern Ireland starts. And, and, and the Republic, or Republic of Ireland starts. Colleagues of ours, we took them to Donegal once and never crossed the border in our entire lives. So people don't know. You say, you know, name three countries beginning with A. Somebody's sure to say Africa. <laughs> Africa. Oh, I know one. Africa. Because Africa is just over there somewhere. So here we are in our own small lives and contexts, living with the kind of ideas that when I went to America first and I heard Irish Americans, particularly, because those were the people I was with, and uh, Brian, whom I first met in America, be, be, be well, well aware of this as well. But the first time I went to America and met Irish Americans talking about black Americans, they sounded to me like orange men. They said all the same things. Now, I was coming straight off barricades and things, and these people were supposed to be my people. And they talked about other people in exactly the same way that we, uh, being Northern Nationalists, Northern Catholics, were talked about. And now I see people here, after 30 years of struggle, talking like unionists used to talk about us 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And in their heads, it doesn't seem to register. You know, when people, out of people's own mouths, out of a, a mouth, you know, mouth reared in Belfast, out of a mouth reared on the Falls Road, come these words, they don't want to work. They just want to live in our benefits. Do their ears not hear them? Do your own ears, you know, do their own ears not hear the words coming out of their mouths and say, that's what other people used to say about my mother and my father, my brother and sister and grandmother. So if it wasn't true about them, do they never question why might it be true about other people? And it's interesting why we don't, why we don't question it. We don't question it because of these wee links about who we see ourselves as being. So when we get out of the very small locality of being from West Belfast or being Northern Nationalist or being Northern Unionist or uh, being on this island, we're white. That's who we are. We white. And very deep down in all of our learning, is that the colour God is? God made the world, he made it the same colour as himself. God's white, we are white, and God's Christian. And in the very root of the combination of science, our enlightenment, you know the enlightenment that gave us, gave us uh, Wolf Tone and all them boys? It also gave us scientific racism. 
It also gave us Darwin and all those people, but it, it was the first time, if we go back as far as that, the first time where in beginning to classify people, beginning to classify butterflies and classify tortoises and all the things that Darwin was at in the theory of evolution, people were classified as well. And a pecking order was created that combined developing science, developing thought, existing imperialism, centrism and racism with a world view. And we are imbued with it. We grew up with it. It's part of the way we think. When we're not thinking. Part of the way that we think that we are the most advanced people in the world. Us. We civilised. Just as we know the British didn't civilise us, but we civilised the Southern Hemisphere. We being the white North, white Western Europe. And not only can you not hear intellectually, historically, can you not separate racism out from sectarianism as forms of the same disease. They are both products, like all forms of division. They are products of a system that is capitalist and imperialist. Now, you don't have to be a revolutionary like me to be anti-racist. <coughs> but you can't claim to be a progressive and not be anti-racist. You have to challenge it everywhere you see it. Because I have news for you. Christopher Columbus, contrary to what you were told at school, did not discover America. Neither did St. Brendan. <laughs> it was always there. <laughs> so, if St. Brendan discovered it, or Christopher Columbus discovered it, then Amadou discovered Toro. <laughs> How come he doesn't own it? How come he's not allowed to claim I just have that piece of land? How come he's not allowed to say Right, everybody here has to speak the language I speak. Everybody here has to bow down and kowtow to me. Why? Because my name is Amadou, I just arrived. First time I've been here, never saw the place before, so I discovered it. And all you people are inferior to me because you were already here. Last in is the boss. <laughs> then you know how stupid it was. That only makes sense in a context of power, <coughs> of wealth, of privilege. And so we didn't discover all the things we were taught in history, apart from that we got a bad deal ourselves. We didn't discover America, Australia, Africa. They were all there. We didn't teach anybody anything. Certainly not democracy, religion, civilization, technology. We didn't teach anybody anything. In almost every single part of the world, people were better off before we turned up. Tell you what we did do. We, PFPSN a year. We raped, we plundered, we stole. And on it we built the wealth that is Western Europe. And now we want to say to the people, we stole it off. Don't you come here and take my pill and benefits. <laughs> if the people of Africa, if the people of South America, the native population of North America, the indigenous population of Australia, were to get back what was taken from them, and us were to get back what was taken from us too, because don't forget, it was took from us too. We wouldn't be much better off because we're a very small, piddly wee island. But there were continents. Continents where people's lives were stolen through slavery. And in order to make that work, we had to believe a very fundamental belief. 
that in the pecking order of, humani of humanity, white, Christian, and English-speaking comes first. And that's what matters today, whether you're the person going into a shop in West Belfast and people asking you to put your money on the counter because they don't want to take it off your hand because you might be a traveler, or your hand might be a different color, or your accent might be different. And don't tell me it doesn't happen. It does. Put your money on the counter. I pick it up from there. But I can go in with my wee fat, sweaty hand and you take it out of mine because we're the same. And there's really no difference between that and breaking people's windows, driving people out. But all of that, all of that is based on that same idea. It's the same thing that makes us say, well, Muslims are very extreme. Muslims are very extreme about their religion. Have you ever been, you know, ever been to Northern Ireland? Ever seen what two sects of Christians can do? It's all so deep in us that we don't, we don't realize it unless we're consciously looking at it. But it's not just, you know, not just that we become tainted with it by history. What is it doing to us as well as what is it doing to others? Because we talk about people stealing our benefits, taking our jobs, and not our jobs. People who are buying labor, yours, mine, and everybody else's, are currently buying the labor of new immigrants and migrants as cheap as they can get it. And you're helping them. You're helping them. Because if you're not helping the migrant worker to organize, if you couldn't be arsed to be in a union and you're yourself, where is the strong union, vibrant union, that the last in and the worst treated can join? If the union's decimated already. It's not the migrant worker who's stealing your job. It's the employer. It's the banker. But you can't make common cause with your real ally because that person has different birthright, different color, different passport. Now we used to be good at preaching to the loyalists of East Belfast about how they just needed to overcome their sectarianism and join in the class battle with us. <coughs> Shoes on the other foot. We need to recognize that we are part of the oppression if we're not actively opposing it. We are part of the oppression that is providing cheap labor. We're part of the oppression that is providing racial violence. We're part of the oppression that is continuing the stereotyping of people. But all of it, all of it is minimal compared to what's happening at an institutional level. The state is constructed and we all know that argument from West Belfast, the state is constructed to be sectarian. It is also constructed to be racist, and it's also constructed to be in the interest of owners and bankers and employers. So all of the racism that you see of the window broken, it's more crude, it's more immediate, it's more violent, but it's not any more insidious than the polite racism that constitutes the behavior of people providing services in the state. The polite racism that thinks cheap labor is good enough for Filipino nurses. But then we don't want everybody taking note and then foreigners taking up the maternity wards. It's good enough to have people providing us with cheap labor but don't take up our benefits. Don't live beside me. And for God's sake, don't marry my daughter or my son. 
we really have to start waking it up. And people are saying, oh, racism is in, you know, racism is in new sectarianism. Ask the traveler population. Ask the minority ethnic population who've been here all through the troubles and before it. The people who came into Craig Allen from Vietnam. Ask the people who came in uh, from India in, in 47. Are we racist or are we not? I would like for Warren to say, you see this here, invaluable. You have to make a start somewhere. We're not going to change the whole system overnight. We're not going to change the government. We're not going to change institutional racism. But we can begin to change ourselves. And we can begin to challenge this cosy idea. I know we say West, <coughs> West Belfast, because that's where I am. It's transferable to wherever we are. But that's where you are now. <coughs> this cosy idea that West Belfast is a good place to live, you know? It's a good place to live because we're nice people, we're friendly people. By and large, we're good people. If that is not the experience of the most vulnerable, if that is not the experience of the West Belfast outsider, then you're not good people. You know, you're not good people. If you're not good to the person who's, who's the outlier, the outflanker, not good to the person who arrived last, then you're not, you, you can't claim that this is a good, a good society, that this is a good environment. It's, you're not bad people, but you have to keep challenging everything you do. Because right under your nose, the kind of things that we, which is the kind of we I believe in, the kind of things we fought for, we are losing. And the kind of things we fought against are happening day and daily up and down that road. Day and daily to people who don't belong. Don't belong because their skin's the wrong color. Don't belong because they've got the wrong passport. Don't belong because they've got the wrong political opinion. Don't belong because we don't like their face. We are rolling backwards. And this is a great opportunity for people to say, this is as far as it goes. If we are not challenging racism, I don't mean you have to start a row every day, but nobody, people say Dungannon is the racial attack capital of Northern Ireland because you hear about it. I don't know whether it is or not, but I do know that nobody in Dungannon who conducts a racial attack on somebody else gets away with it secretly. That, that's the best we can do. It doesn't happen without us challenging it. Nobody denies a service to people who are entitled to it without us challenging it. And so people may initially say, oh God, we're giving the place a bad name. That's what they tell us sometimes, you're giving the place a bad name. It's a bad place if those things happen. And I would like to see from here people coming and joining with this group of people. People beginning to make these pledges real. And no matter where you see it, racist jokes aren't funny. No matter where you see it, lies about people coming in and taking your job aren't true. You need to challenge the myths, you need to challenge the stereotypes every single time you hear them. You find your own strategies for doing it, but you have to do it. You see, if you don't, then you're an accomplice to racism. People any uh, want to pick up on anything that Bernd has said, any comments. Um, but also I'd encourage people who are here, there's a lot of people who have contributed to the booklet. Um, maybe if you want to just say a little bit about what your group or organisation is doing, or some of the authors of the, of the essays in the booklet as well, just encourage you to, to chip into the discussion. Yeah. I hope I can formulate this neatly. I, I grew up in London, second generation Irish. Once you're up the ladder a little bit, 
and Joe White, I used to say that for many second generation children, claiming your Irishness was like claiming your sixth toe. It was a hidden thing. You're white, but you can pass for the rest of the community. You can be the host community. You can be as English if you choose, or whatever, or American as the rest. But others cannot. And it is how easy people from our background then don't, you know, having remembered what we've gone through and where the struggle, you know, where we've struggled here, but also in the rest of the world and have been nobody's darling, how quickly you forget that and then treat out the same treatment that the oppressors did to you. You must be mindful every single day of the way you come from and what you extend to other people as well. <coughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I just want to thank you, uh, West Against Racism, for this uh, invaluable work you are doing every year, and uh, especially during this uh, festival period, which is good. And for every word Benedict has said here, yeah, it's real. It's real for me as a black person living South Belfast in a loyalist area and walking north. In the community that I think I'm at home with. Because here in West Belfast, I just feel relaxed. I go everywhere, I move everywhere. But the experience is not the same. Very much so. This gentleman here demonstrated something that's very uh, touching for me. A glass of water was offered to him, and I said that I give him water as well. So he gave me his food, which is very good and it's very encouraging. So those are the practical things that people can do and make people feel at peace. We are very vulnerable. And when people look at you in a funny way, talk to you in a funny way, the real one is wanting to give money to people and people are looking at you like a dog. So um, I just want to thank everybody. Um, for those that are here, either you share what uh, West Against Racism is, is doing or you are against it, just think about it. Think about the fact that my language is not good enough. The British came in and said we should forget about our language. The language that about 60, 70 million people speaks and it's not a language, it's a dialect. So there are loads of issues there for people. I just want to thank you and for, for, for those that have contributed to the book as well. And for the elected representative in West Belfast, I would like to say this. People are doing uh, good work at the minute. He has to be transformed practically. People have to stand up and challenge people. Um, I'm not a violent person, and this community has gone through a hell, through a lot of traumatic, violent experience. But at the same time, you don't have to take it on other people. Irish people are just like black people of Europe. So we are the same, we share the same thing. And as I said there, yeah, um, I'd just like to thank you all. And God continue to be with you. Thanks very much, Slack. Hi, I'm Bernadette. I'm currently um, I'm an occupational psychologist and I'm doing like an anti bullying report at the moment for a certain part of the civil service. And just one of the things I just noticed when I've been doing the report is that I'm a lot of people <coughs> there's two main things that I picked up on from what you said is that um, a lot of people simply don't have self awareness mm -hmm. about their own racism. And they can't really distinguish between the prejudice and discrimination. So one of the first things, like me, for example, like with myself, I would say that would I define myself as a person that's anti-racist? Yes. But have I got racism in me? Of course. If I see a black man walk through the door, I look and I go, "There's a black man." That's instantly racist. But that what I what I do is I try to automatically <coughs> not be discriminatory because. For example, um, and I notice a lot of people when they do this in employment situations, they'll literally actively discriminate. If you begin to recognize the own prejudice that you have, then you can change the behavior, which is the discrimination, and you can change the prejudice. But people here really don't department. The departmentalize in their brain, it's like you said, it's okay to like the bulbs because they're Catholic, but it's okay to get the Brits. But it's okay. and, I, and I notice that even like myself, I'm from West Belfast, I'm from Plenty of West Belfast. Some people are appalled if I say that I've got really good English friends, or I love I love certain parts of England, and it's 
a lot of people here just departmentalized or hit it. It's, it's okay to hit one type, it's not okay to hit another. And people here a lot simply don't have self-awareness. They're not getting it. No, I, think, no, I think you're right. And I think one of the things that we, we tend to forget you know, which, which always astounds me is that we forget where we've been. You know, we are damaged people. We can't not, I don't mean that there's something wrong with us, but we cannot have been where we have been and not, and it not impact on us. Uh, for many people, for many, I'd say for more people than not, coping with the traumatic lives that we have had in the course of all our lifetimes has allowed us to departmentalize. That's how you cope. There are things that go on, that's just what we've always done. Otherwise our heads would have blown apart. We just have all just had a mental image of that, that we just would all have self imploded or exploded long ago. And so we still have this capacity and we still have this habit of putting the things in our heads in boxes that are mutually exclusive. But as long as we keep them in the boxes and we don't set them out together, we don't see that they don't fit. But I'm also mindful not to go to the point where racism is there for, because I think that's a wrong conclusion. I think it is very important that each of us are critically self-aware and challenge the prejudice within ourselves. We've all got prejudices. I, I always at this point state, and I will state again, I am too old to live long enough to change my prejudices, gain through life experience against the police. I'm too old. I'm also not willing enough to try. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just a reality. I'm not I'm not asking for a round of applause for my prejudice. <laughs> I'm merely saying everybody, you know, everybody has got key prejudices they won't let go of. My husband's is free staters. Not <laughs> <laughs> very special kind of person from the south of Ireland. He defines the very clear definition of what constitutes free stater, it moves from time to time. But it's anybody from the south of Ireland who disagrees with my husband's political opinions, <laughs> attitudes of the day, beat him at the dogs, uh, or gave him a bad meal. Or, but anyway, they're all. So we, what I'm saying is we all have prejudices. But it's also, I think, a mistake to reduce racism to, uh, you know, to the, the accumulated effect of individual behaviours, because it's not. If it was only the accumulated effect of, of, of individual behaviours, then we would adopt a, a, a purely educational, psychological, corrective medical model to change in it. It is systematic, it is based in the economic, social and political structures and rationale of our state. And, and so there has to be two levels of challenge. But it's very easy and too easy for people who have historically been in opposition to the state to take on the battle of institutional racism up here, which they can't change tomorrow, and not challenge at that community level where they can make greater changes. So while I agree with you, I wouldn't want to go to the, to the point of view and say that if we all just thought differently, it wouldn't happen. You know, like we all, we all wish we were all richer, but we're not. Indi individually, changing our individual habits isn't ever going to change the economics of this country. We need to change the basis uh, on which they're constructed. And racism is the same, it keeps, keeps happening. Well, I've followed you for about 35 years, and I'll, I'll love you to death, and if you don't say. And this is the first time in my life I'm dead nervous. I wanted to maybe sell you tickets just to be there. I'm pulling that all out in the spirit of having a little bit. See, I always think of racism. I think of basically the state and power relations. And I think of, um, you know, why do we have borders? Why can't we have open borders? I think of the RDC, sorry, PSNI, 
who, who did it the way. I think this past two weeks when they arrested people who were about to get married from different nationalities. And the problem that I have is that we, we are, the last point was a cracker, we are moving from our understanding of racism and we're now psychologizing it. And I'm going to say something point blank just to you and to share it yourself. I have no racism in me. It's become very trendy among <coughs> anti racists to say we're all a bit racist. I don't have to pick it up from the McPherson report. I have to just McPherson. stop you a minute because I wouldn't like you to go on on something on a all misunderstanding. Right. I am not saying that, that we're all racist. What I did say is our thinking is racially constructed. I don't mean that's not saying that we are racist. Our thinking is racially constructed because the environment in which we think and live and breathe over generations is racially constructed. That's very, very different from saying, and I, I agree with you, uh, you know, there's no racism in me and there's no sectarianism in me, but I have enough prejudice to fill this room all by myself. Uh, well, I show they're different things. I show your husband's point about certain free staters. <laughs> no <laughs> racism in him. So, <laughs> funny enough, I, I wouldn't call that racism, but for that, this is what I would say. I, I'm a teacher, and I teach just outside London, in, in Watford, and I actually think we've got this stage uh, sometimes where the people who are anti-racist are our problem in terms of a lot of the racial etiquette that's been used and you can't say that word, don't say that word. And of course a lot of that is very, very well intentioned, but what I find is it often distorts what are often sort of spontaneous and natural relationships between young students who are not about together. And they might say certain words which are sort of persona non grata or whatever. And I think that, you know, I don't have an answer to it. Maybe I'm just wrong and because you attack me. But I, but I do want to say that I do feel uncomfortable with a lot of what I consider to be often the plenty crack sort of approach to how you actually tackle questions of racism. And, and that you have in England, David Cameron and politicians, and I noticed on the wee booklet, it says we'll get MLAs and MPs to sign certain charters. So these MPs and MLAs and all the rest sign all these little anti racist things, you know, do the right thing, but they make laws. They're the people who have power who are the real problem. It just seems to me there's a danger that you can pathologize an awful lot of working class people in West Belfast or anywhere else. And in that sense, and of course racism takes place, but as it happens, I don't think your average person when you walk out onto the Falls Road outside St. Mary's is particularly racist. And I think there is a danger, and I just want to throw it into this discussion of an honest debate, I think there is a danger that we start to see those people as somehow uh, I can't think of the word, sort of like um, a problem. Well, I, to some extent, you know, I, I, there are things that you're saying I'd agree with you. But I'll give you a, a number of just things that come into my mind. Actually, on, on my holidays yesterday, I had a friend called and their, and their children, and the parent was extremely embarrassed because the wee boy said, Am I, am I allowed to give people my middle finger? And the mother said, you are not. <laughs> I said, well, why not? Because so I so and so gave somebody the middle finger. And she said, no, you're not. And I said, what, is, what does middle finger mean? He said, I don't know. But <laughs> so and so does this. And I said, you know what it means? It means... I am the stupidest person in the room. <laughs> <laughs> and he just put his hand behind his back. Now, because the, the person, yes, the child did that because everybody else did it. But when you said to him, do you know what that means? That means you're the stupidest person in the room. He said, I'm not going to do it. It's the meaning of things sometimes that matter. And, and we're... we're uh, you say things, and I, I appreciate that quite often people will use the wrong word. That doesn't make them bad people. And quite often people use all the right words, uh, use them to hide very subtle prejudices. But words do matter. So if, if words don't matter, then let's call all the Protestants Huns. Let's call all the Catholics takes. Just all right. Let's just, you know. Let's just, uh, let's call all the women sluts. 
it's all right. Words don't count. Because we have internalized that we've passed that. You know, if 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 I got up here and, and spoke in a manner uh, and used some of the words that are now no longer no longer acceptable to use about women. Just not used. You know, and I'm not gonna start I was tempted, but I'm not. I'm just gonna start and say some of them because we're now <coughs> We don't use them. And now we've internalised that we don't use them. So no, it's not all right. It's, y you understand where it comes from. But no, it's not all right to say nigger. It might be all right to say it once because you didn't know the offence that it caused. It's not all right to say packet. No, it's just not. Now the person who says it may, like the child who puts up his middle finger, not at that point have an understanding of how insulting it is. It's not all right to say knacker. You know, it's not all right, it's not all right to a person's face or behind their back. It's dehumanizing, it's insulting, and it's not okay. Now, how you deal with that, how you explain to people, you're right about strategy and, and how it's done, but no, not all right. You and like it if I called you a dick. Brenda, I agree with 90% of what you say, but uh, you see, it's funny you say the word hun, because I'm not going to tell you a lie. I'll admit, I, I, I thought I called these response huns, right? That's the name I use. And, but you hun, shouldn't. But Brenda, here's the point. Here's the point. See if you take a word and it's historically specific circumstances. It can mean different things at different times. Now, I, see, I would say I'm absolutely anti sectarian. Now, people can laugh because I use the word hun. But to me, because some people... Well, can I ask you a question? A can I go and ask you a question now? That, that's all right if you feel like that. Why are you so sensitive then until people have been called racist if they mightn't be racist? It's only a name. Well, the point I'm making is, see the word cake, for example? I don't have a problem with, you know, obviously I, re I realize some people use that as a term of abuse. You think, I just read the wee article for self support fanzine. self supporters are all upset about wages fancy sing the famine song. The famine's over, why don't you go home? And I think sometimes, actually, you do have to get a bit of a thick skin, and you have to have, you know, I believe in free speech and tolerance. Well, look, I, so I, I agree, and I don't want this just to get into a dispute or discussion between the two of us, but how would you feel if just you said, I'm a Celtic supporter, and I said, that explains it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how would you feel? <laughs> how would you feel? No, no, but do you feel I'm stereotyping you? Do you know because it would be. No, but that's fair enough. But I don't think that I don't think that people's ability or responsibility to internalize and not be offended by abuse directed towards them should be determined by the thickness of their own skin. It shouldn't be in the same way. If I would say to you, you say I'm a Celtic supporter, and I would say to you that explains it, that's stereotyping. It's not acceptable for me to say because you're a, a Celtic supporter you hold a set of opinions. That's stereotyping. Now, you're entitled to say yourself, if you don't mind being called, if you don't mind being called a hun or being called a tag or being called whatever, that's your personal opinion. But you can't generalise that to other people. You can't say it because you don't mind being called names because you have a thick skin <coughs> that other people in the room should be as thick skinned as you because those have stereotyping connotations that help to continue and prolong these those ideas. And you know, it's step by step you get. There might be nothing wrong with with, you know, mightn't be anything grievously wrong with certain names, but then it gets more and it gets more and it gets more till people can be called a dog or a rat or a mad dog. And then somebody can kill them and nobody cares. Why? Because they aren't really people. They're rats, they're dogs, they're mad dogs. You know, that's where it ends. But you're entitled to your opinion. Okay. Thank you. Hopefully you're still going to follow Bernadette. 90% <laughs> of the wrong. <laughs> Can I, just because it, uh, uh, we're con conscious of time, but I'm really keen to bring in Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, I think what Brian said is right. I think people 
you know, if you do nothing else today, then commit yourself to supporting one, to, to knowing where they are, uh, to seeing when at some time you can link in, link in with them. Uh, interestingly enough, the, the issue of what constitutes racism uh, as a definition. What constitutes race <coughs> as a definition is very interesting. There's only one race, the human race. Some people are smaller than others, and some people are fatter than others, and some people are brighter than others, and some people are harder to get the message over to others. There is a, there is a human race, there's one human race, and the basis on which that human race has been separated and categorized has changed. The one that has endured from the age of enlightenment, one that has endured <coughs> has been a, a definition of racism based on physical, visual attributes like uh, Caucasian, Mongol, uh, black, white, yellow skin color, big marker of race. But it wasn't always like that. In fact, if you go far enough back, I mean, definitions of people in groups and categories <coughs> has gone on for a long time. But historically, people like us, white, short-necked, fair hardy people that came from this particular band of Europe and, and were thought to be fairly barbarian, in the Roman times, they thought it was the bad weather did it to us. And people were actually racially classified on the kind of weather they lived in. Asians were believed to be placid people because of the, the, the weather conditions and the, you know, the environment in which they lived. And it was our hostile uh, environment that people thought made us warlike <coughs> and kind of hard to get anything into our heads. So how people classify broad swathes of other people have, has differed over time. The one that currently endures is, is race divided, race determined essentially by skin color and physical at attribute. And people still, you know, if you ask people sometimes, as again we would do in training sometimes, you know, trying to get people to think very quickly, say how many races are, people go fight. Just instinctively. You say you don't, your, ra your thinking isn't racially constructed. You say to people sometimes, how many races are, and they go, oh, yeah, uh, uh, mm, no, four, no, five. It's one, one human race. So racism in itself is fundamentally a belief that humanity can be divided for the purpose of rights, privileges, and power, and access to resources, that the human race can be subdivided fundamentally on the basis of color. That to me is the simplest definition of racism. And, and then how could it be right? If you then say, well then what's, you know, what's sectarianism? It's the same kind of thing. That, that people's religious beliefs should determine their pecking order in the world. And then you understand what it's about. It's the same about people's, people's sexual orientation or whatever. And then you ask yourself the fundamental question, in whose interest is it? In whose interest is it to subdivide us into these small categories? Why, why would that make sense to anybody? And then you remember something else that we all know, because united we stand and divided we fall. So if we can divide ordinary working people ordinary, common people into a belief that they do not have a universal solidarity of class. Then you can rule them forever. And that takes us back to Bill's point. And I keep making those points all the time. I'll say that before I go. You don't have to be a socialist to oppose racism and prejudice, but oppose it with honesty dignity and integrity, and you'll end up a socialist. <laughs> <laughs>
heads off, just to say thanks very much again to Bernie. That's just a wonderful presentation and, and discussion as well.